Mark, what's up, man? Welcome to the Dad Edge. Hey, thanks, Larry. I'm I'm excited to be here. Pretty exciting hey. to be interviewed on <laughs> Dad Edge. Dad Edge, yeah, man. I'm, 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 I'm excited to share this. Uh, I'm really excited to share this story. Uh, this is a story that I remember meeting you for the first time on Zoom. Uh, and I know you're a part of our Dad Edge Accelerator program, which is our mastermind for business owners. But, you know, the 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 conversation that you have after you applied for for the uh for the dad edge was I, I i never heard a story quite like it and i've never forgotten it and to be honest I, I don't think i ever will um and it's pretty moving and that's why i was really excited to to interview you and talk to talk about this particular topic we're gonna we're gonna talk about today before we do that do you want to do some warm some fun warm-up questions <laughs> sure that sounds All right. good okay um what is something that you enjoy doing most outside of uh, time with your lovely bride and kids and outside of work? Something that brings you joy. Dirt biking. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of bike? What kind of bike do you have? Uh, I have a, a KTM 300 XTW. That's, that's a two stroke, right? Yeah. Two stroke. Yeah. We had this discussion when we were actually in Colorado. In I've, Colorado. I've got a, I've got a Honda 250, um, but it's a four stroke. So it's not, not nearly as squirrely as, as that. So how, how long have you been dirt biking for? Uh, you know, my first dirt bike I got when I was maybe 13, it's an XR 100 and then moved into the two stroke world at CR 125 and then kind of got out of it for a long time and then moved to Crested Butte and we're at the like epicenter of dirt biking here. Our, our house is at the end of cement Creek Canyon and that Canyon leads to pretty much all of the mountains in between here and Buena Vista. And it's just the most ideal place to have a dirt bike and go explore. And you can go so far so fast and get so remote so quickly. It's amazing. I'll have to share a couple of pictures from the other night. Yeah, I man. Thought of you actually, while I was taking them, I was like, Larry would love this. Oh, I would, man. Have you ever gotten lost? Mm, no, no, that's good. Yeah, just no. pin your location and be good. Um, yeah, you know, one of those little in reaches constantly sending me locations and sending Liz my location. That's a good idea. That way, no one finds you like under a rock or half eaten by a bear or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, especially now that I'm on blood thinners for the rest of my life, it's kind of one of those things that I kind of, my doctor doesn't, my cardiologist doesn't really want me doing what I'm doing. So my way to make amends is to at least keep track of where I am. <laughs> there you go. That's a good idea. Like at least let people know where you're at. So, so they can find my body. <laughs> what what have been how many kids do you have so the audience knows i have two kids a seven-year-old daughter and a six-year-old boy all right so what have you learned that's been unexpected about being a father over the past seven years huh you know i think the thing that instantly happened um my wife had both of our kids at home she's super powerful, strong woman. We had a, a midwife. And um, so both kids were born in our bedroom. Um, and just the instant change or instant. Sorry, like puppy. Um, hold on one second. Hey, Taco, what are you doing? Yeah, I named the dog Taco. I was going to say, did you name your dog Taco? <laughs> that is is Mark Steve. Um, Taco, what are you doing? Come here. Is is he a uh, Chihuahua? He's uh let me put him in his crate. Hold on. Taco, come. Push pause on recording. No, you're good. This is actually a really good time that if you are a dad business owner and you're looking for community, we talked about the Dad Edge Accelerator program. That's where we are helping dad business owners and men elevate their businesses, scale their impact, become more profitable, but not at the expense of creating an extraordinary marriage, uh, an amazing connection with their wives and unbelievable connection and experiences with their kids. So I, that wasn't even read or prepared. I just like rolled that off. What'd you think, Mark? That was good. You know, I, I just caught the end of it, but it sounded familiar. 
Uh, you can find that. Find at the dad. Yeah, you like it. You can find it at the dadedge.com forward slash alliance to apply, even if you're a business owner, same, same spot. Um, but yeah, okay. So what have these what what have these two kids taught you about oh, your yeah. fatherhood? Yeah, so it was like this instant redefinition of love. Like oh. I thought that I knew what love was prior to having kids, but then all of a sudden it's this whole new depth and dimension of of caring and and thoughtfulness and purpose. Um like, holy cow, I I all of a sudden have two little people that I'm responsible for. And and that has, yeah, completely reshaped my life. And then, and in that shaping or that the people that having to be responsible for the, these little people, it's, it's, that's the other thing that I would say is that instantly seeing feedback when they model. So like the other day, Liz and I were having a little bit of a spat and then words from that same spat came up from my seven-year-old to my wife. And then from my seven-year-old to her six-year-old brother, like instantly seeing how quickly they change and adapt and, and are influenced by their role models. And that's, that's been hugely eye-opening. It's it's crazy. All of a sudden, I'm I'm realizing that I really need to shape up because <laughs> I I need to be a better role model. I, they need to see what a dad's supposed to be like, what a husband's supposed to be like, and and they have no concept of of that, but it's glaringly apparent for me. I'll tell you, man. Um, one thing I want to share is that, so I have a 14 year old and a 16 year old, and I will tell you, like, you think that a lot of what you're doing and saying might go unnoticed, but they catch, especially my 14 year old, he catches everything, like everything. Like it's almost scary. We've actually nicknamed him the observant ninja because he sees all and hears all. And sometimes I'm like, man, like I can never put it past these kids that they are not like literally catching every single thing yeah. that we're saying and doing. And they're probably just, you know, and, and sometimes I don't even realize until they bring it to my attention, which is kind of scary. So no. yeah, man, I totally feel you on that one. And what about marriage? What's been something that's been unexpected that you've learned about how, how long have you and Liz been married? 14 years. Okay. So in the past 14 years, what are some unexpected things that you've, you've learned? Um, I think lately it's been <clears throat> really defining what commitment means. Um, and what, what wedding vows are. Yeah. Um, Feel like I was pretty young when we got married. I'm I'm 43 now, and so 14 years. So whatever the math is, I think I was 26, something like that, when I got married. Um, that's not right. 27, no. Um, anyway, I was young, and I think we read our or wrote our own vows and and read them to each other. And I think looking back on those it's, it's something that, that I really have changed my interpretation of as I've gotten older, that <clears throat> this isn't a conditional thing. This isn't, a uh, I will love you if, I mean, it really needs to be a vow. It really needs to be a commitment. It really needs to be unconditional that even if I'm pissed off at her, I, I still need to love her. And the whole death to us part thing, I think is, is, is real. <laughs> and that's been something that I've been kind of working through as I get older, that I really made a commitment to her and I need to stick through it and stick to it and, and hold up my end of the vow. You know, I I've, I've interviewed obviously a lot of people and, and very few people talk about their vows, which is interesting. You know, it's like the, it's like these, the list of promises that we, we are meant to keep. 
And yeah. I think a lot of it's kind of, go, it goes in one ear and out the other. But if you really think about it, that's, those are the foundational things that, you know, when it, when push comes to shove, you know, that's, that's, that's a foundational element in our marriages. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, till death to us part and, you know, I, I really want to focus a lot of this podcast on your, on an experience that you had not too long ago, um, in your own life. And I, and I would love for you to tell the story. Sure. Um, 29, I was 29 when I got married. That's the math. <laughs> uh, so let's see in August, it was August 15th of 2020. Um, Liz woke me up around 1230 at night. So I guess really it was the 16th of August. Um, and she said I was making too much noise and interrupting her sleep. And it was kind of, I mean, I, it's something that she's done in the past. I mean, I, I snore occasionally and can be restless. And so she woke me up thinking that was what was going on. And I woke up, I remember just being confused or feeling like I was, really drunk or really high or something. I don't know. I felt really weird, felt really confused. And so I got up and went to the bathroom, came back and just, I felt like I had slept on one side of my body and, and that it had gone numb and, and I couldn't feel it. And so Liz was like, well, I think maybe you just slept on it wrong. It's probably fine. I was like, no, I really can't feel my arm. And, and then it started to get worse and like, it turned into just my entire arm was, was dead, um, and couldn't move it at all. And then she's, she's a nurse and I'm an ENT. And I think we both started having our mental path start going down this track of, could this really be happening? Could I really be having a stroke? And so she started to kind of do all the the tests that you can do for somebody that's having a stroke and having me smile and having me try to formulate a, a sentence. Um, she had me <clears throat> go to the closet and get a t-shirt out of my drawer. And then she asked me what I'd gotten my t-shirt out of. And I could not come up with the word drawer. I really wanted to, I feel like I, I knew what the word was that I was supposed to be saying, but I couldn't say it. And then it proceeded to just get worse and worse. I just, the words couldn't come out of my mouth. I, I or wouldn't come out of my mouth. Um, and yeah, so I was having a stroke and my wife luckily called her mom who lives a couple doors down and she was able to come over and watch the kids. She slept on the couch and then all of a sudden I was in the car driving to the hospital because it was, we live in a tiny, tiny little town in Colorado. And we both used to volunteer for the ambulance and we knew what the response time would be as far as how much time it would be for the volunteers to wake up, get out of bed, leave from their house, go up to the fire station, get the ambulance and drive down. That by that time that with strokes, I mean, everything is, is all about timing and, and there was really no way of knowing when it had all really started because I had been asleep. Um, and so she just started driving and called the the nurse's desk and told them, hey, I'm coming down with my, hu my husband and he's having all the signs and symptoms of the stroke. Uh, just be ready. And um, by the time I got to the hospital, um, half of my body had completely turned numb and I couldn't talk at all. Um, and on the way down, it, it was like, it was so, um, it was traumatizing. I mean, I was, <clears throat> I felt like I was stuck in my body knowing that I was having a stroke, knowing that I hadn't said goodbye to my kids and knowing that I could possibly die within the next hour or two or if i didn't die that i could just be a vegetable or that i may not ever talk again and i can't even begin to describe to you what that felt like to be sitting there in the passenger side of the car that i'd been 
means like you're in this spot that you're comfortable in, in your own car, but thinking about things so differently because yeah, you, you can't talk anymore. You can't feel half of your body. <laughs> um, and I didn't get to say goodbye to my kids. And I just, I felt like that was the one thing that stuck in my head was that we hadn't woken up the kids because it was the middle of the night and they were going to wake up and we were both going to be gone and how scary that is going to be for them and how scary it was for me because I didn't know if I was going to see them again or if I would be able to tell them that I love them ever again. And so it was like, I don't know. I think you, people always, well, at least I have, have worried about death in the past. And, and I think the reason I had worried about death in the past was because I had had been having these kind of heart fluctuations or these weird feelings in my heart. And doctors kind of always just wrote it off. One doctor told me that I just needed to re-stratify myself, that I was having these anxiety or panic attacks that that really I should go to a counselor, um, which is never bad advice. <laughs> but um, turns out that I have a super rare cardiac disease and, and I was having symptoms of that disease for a few months leading up to it, maybe even a few years. Um, and yeah, so it was super scary. And uh, then as I'm sitting there in the ER, um, I could see in my wife's face that something was changing. And that's when the, the whole left side of my face started to droop and she ran out of the ER. She had worked in the ER for a while. So she knew all the nurses and knew the whole, knew everybody. And so she ran out and ran and got the doctor and said, he's, he's stroking out. He's it's happening right now. We need to, he needs to be flown. And I did, I got flown down to Denver um, and landed in Denver and spent a week in Denver and they did all kinds of tests um, and by the, the next morning, I, I actually was able to talk again. And most of the symptoms of my stroke had resolved, which was a crazy blessing. My parents call it the stroke of good luck. Um, because it was then through all the, the tests that they did, that they found a super rare cardiac disease called cardiac sarcoidosis. And, and my immune system had decided that, the left side of my heart was not supposed to be there <laughs> and was a, a villain that it needed to attack. And so it turned the entire left side of my heart into scar tissue. <clears throat> God. And so the left ventricle is what pushes the blood out into all of the organs. And that had turned into scar to the point that the apex of the left ventricle was akinetic or not moving at all anymore. And they think that's where the, the clot formed was in that part of the heart that wasn't moving. And then it got pushed out into my brain and that's what caused the stroke. And yeah, typically the first symptom of this disease that I have is just sudden death. Um, and so they implanted a defibrillator in my chest. Um, they found that my heart ejection for the left ventricular ejection fraction was 24%, which is, pretty much near fatal as it was. Um, and um, put me on blood thinners and I'm on 16 other meds that I take daily. I take a chemotherapy drug every Tuesday night. It makes me feel like crap. <clears throat> um, but yeah, that's kind of the the, the gist of what happened. <laughs> uh, are there any more details you want to, you want to hear about? Well, I mean, man, I, I remember the first time that we talked and I remember you going into some detail about all this, but not to that detail. And the interesting thing about being on this side of the microphone is that when, you know, a guest who comes on the podcast comes on and, and shares a story, what I do, and I think a lot of the audience does is, especially as dads and husbands, like we all relate to each other in that way. 
like we put ourselves in that position and I'm, I'm thinking about you as if I'm me. Right. And I can't articulate, you know, I, I need to go get my clothes out of the drawer and I can't think of that, that word or waking up and being confused and feeling like I was drunk, but I can't feel one side of my body. And then knowing, having the knowledge, right. Because I also have a healthcare background knowing that like, wow, this is, could actually be what's happening to me. And that scares the crap out of you. And then on your way to the hospital and, and all these thoughts are going through your mind as you're, as you describe it. And I remember you talking about this on the first time we talked in your body, having these thoughts, but you can't do anything about it. It's just sort of happening to you. It's got to, it's got to feel like one of the most uncontrollable things that you could possibly imagine. So, yeah. um, you seem like though, like, man, you're like fully recovered. I mean, I spent time with you, you know, in Colorado when we did our retreat for the data accelerator program for our guys who are a part of that. Um, you know, when we went hiking, we went up to Pikes peak, you know, we broke bread, we talked a lot and I would never, like, if I, if I didn't know that about you, I would have never guessed like you seem like healthy as a horse. Hey, I, I'm guessing, have you made a full recovery from this? Yeah, I'd say I've, I've made a full recovery. Um, my ejection fraction is up to 49%. So right around the same as maybe an 85 year old man. Um, and it has stayed there the last year, which is super frustrating for me. Um, I've been doing all kinds of things to try to make it better. Um, hoping to be above 50% because the doctors would consider getting me off of the blood thinner if my <clears throat> ejection fraction was in the fifties, but it hasn't. And they don't think that it ever will, <clears throat> which is frustrating. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think like you were saying that the being trapped in your own body, it, it was, it felt like being like this. I, I guess it this has redefined like my, feeling of, of how like a vegetable, like, you know, the person that, that has some kind of injury and then they're considered a vegetable or, or like my, my uncle has been having this super weird dementia and not been able to talk. And, and it's like, I, I always wonder if they feel the same way that I did. Cause it was, it was, it was so traumatic to have my brain be functioning in a way that my internal dialogue was all still happening normally to me. It all felt normal to me, but I just couldn't talk. I couldn't, I couldn't say any of the things I wanted to say. And it was, yeah, traumatizing. I have, um, no, I have no doubt. I can't even imagine. Um, what has life, what was life like before this and what's life like now? And, and I want, I want you to put this through the lens of, uh, you know, you mentioned when you're on your way to the hospital and in the hospital, what if I can't say goodbye to my kids or what if I'm a vegetable or what if I die or what if this, or what if that? So, um, what has life been like for you now? You know, um, I think leading up to the stroke, I kind of was a bit on autopilot, was growing my business um, and spending a lot of time growing my business and making making that happen. And, and I would say kind of living a bit on autopilot, going through the motions. Um, and then now, um, I guess it all feels finite. It feels more like there's a, there could be a hard stop and that hard stop could be at any point. And I think about death pretty much all the time, not all the time, four or five times a day, I would say like any time that my heart does something weird. I wonder if my defibrillator is going to go off or if I'm reading a book with my kids and my son's head is on my chest. I wonder if, if the defibrillator shocks me, is it going to shock him too? 
Um, I wonder, yeah, because I mean, having the number one symptom be sudden death, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to to live with um, and to process. And most times that this disease isn't found until the autopsy after. Um, and so I think everything from after the stroke on has been, I'm, I'm trying to be much more intentional and much more in the moment and present. And I, I'd love to say that I'm great at it, but I'm not. Um, but I'm aware of it and, and working towards it as something that I know is something I, I want to have happen for myself and for my kids. I think after, after the stroke, I've definitely leaned into your group um, and the idea of, of living leg legendary or leaving a legacy. I think that's, that's something that has been at the forefront of my brain is, is how can I leave something behind with my kids that they'll remember me and they'll remember me as this super strong, caring, loving, funny, all the things that you want to be read at your eulogy. I want those things to be true. I want those things to be something that everybody says because that's how I lived my life. And so that's, it's been much more, trying to yeah trying to change not be so i don't know so selfish comes to mind I don't, I don't, i'm trying not to be selfish anymore i'm trying to be giving and 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 loving and kind and and yeah living up to my vows <laughs> to my wife <laughs> um what are your everyday conversations like with your kids now that like, do, does it ever run through your mind of, and, and I, I don't mean this to sound morbid or, or anything like that, but does it ever just run through your mind of like, I want to tell them this before I go to bed tonight because it's important for them to know it. Or is, is there things that are on like on your radar more so now when it comes to things like that? Like, like I, I would say the essence of what I'm saying is like, Carpe diem, you know, are you, are you, are you seizing the day? Are you seizing moments more so now than how you were before? I'd say, yeah, I, I think the, the, the requests of, can we read one more book or can we just spend a little bit more time doing whatever it is that we're doing? I, I try to say yes to all the time now. Um, but yeah, it might lead to a tired kid in the morning because we stayed up late reading books, but man, that time laying there together is something that, that I hold dear to my heart now. Um, not that I didn't before, but it's, it's something that's much more, uh, on the, the forefront of my brain and, yeah, those making sure to get those hugs and those hugs, I, I think I'd squeeze a little longer. <laughs> um, and my daughter is really good at giving hugs. <laughs> so I soak those up every chance I can. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say seize the day. Yeah, that, that makes that makes sense to me. How long ago did, did this happen? It was August of 2020. So they, they think that we had, my wife and I had got, we'd gotten COVID in March of 2020. We were, our county here is, um, it's tiny, but we also have a lot of resort visitors because we live at a ski, ski resort. And so <clears throat> we had some of the earliest cases of COVID in Colorado and our, I'm on the ski patrol here and we had a, a big ski patrol party in February, like late February of 2020. And I think that ended up being a super spreader event um, before that was even known to be a thing. Um, my wife was, was cleaning the house right at the resort had been forced to close because of COVID. And, and right after that, 
my wife started just cleaning things with, with Clorox, which I, I didn't know she had done because I couldn't smell it. And then I asked her if she had replaced the Clorox wipes with some type of a homemade version because I could put the Clorox wipe up to my nose and couldn't smell any of it. And that was before the losing sense of taste and smell was even a known thing. Um, and then it became more and more that more and more research was coming out. And then it was like, oh, we we must have COVID. And um the doctors think that that my disease was accelerated by by COVID. And so they think that somewhere between March and August, all of the, the damage to my heart was probably done pretty quickly. Um so yeah, 2020 was a bummer of a year for sure on all fronts. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Um, I I have one more question for you that I would, you know, that, that I think would be appropriate and yet um, also really thought provoking. So how old are you? 43. 43. So you had this and you were 41. If you could go back... Mm -hmm. So you're 43 now, and let's just say you could go back and call yourself on the phone at 35. So like you're, you are who you are now, you get on the phone, you call yourself at, th at 35 years old and be like, hey, Mark, this is me. Um, this is uh, eight years into the future. Um, I want to sit down with you and talk with you about a few things. And I want to give you some advice over the next eight years that I think will change um, how you live. And you have an opportunity to sit down with yourself and talk. What would you, what advice would you give? Hmm. I would say to myself to be patient with myself. I think that I come from some family background of maybe not being the most patient or not the most graceful. Um, so giving myself grace and, and to ease up on my self judgment or hy hypercritical nature that I have. I think I'm always striving to succeed. I'm always try striving to, I mean, I'm, I've been my own boss for, basically my entire career. Um, and so I think I would tell myself to ease up and live life and, and to, to work on patience because at 35, I didn't have kids yet. Well, let's see. Yeah. No. Um, would have been just before our kids were born. Um, and so I, if I were to give advice to how to be a better dad, it would be to, to, to soak up those moments and, and to not react as quickly as I, I had been. I think it, it was always in my nature to instantly um, come up with a thought or a criticism of, of whatever the situation was and to, to let go of that criticism and, and let go of that opinion that I instantly form and, and instead replace it with curiosity or, or gratitude that whatever that experience was that I need to be grateful for it and try to see the positive in it instead of, I think I'm, I've had a, or had a tendency in the past and still do to often have a, a negative light on things or a negative spin to see the dark or the, the not, not the light and to try to really focus on the light or the positivity um, of the moment. 
That'd be what I'd tell myself. I don't, <laughs> and I don't know if my 35 year old self would, would know what to do with that, but <laughs> I, I would imagine that's gotta be some of the same advice that you would give the audience, right. As, as we navigate fatherhood and, and knowing how fragile life can be and it can change in an instant. You know, I, I had a conversation with one of the other guys who's an accelerator uh, earlier today had something happened to him that completely just derailed, like not anything that's like completely life-changing, but one of the things that he said during a conversation, he's like, man, he's like, life is interesting. He's like, you know, you think that, you know, you're on this like steady state, you know, and then all of a sudden something happens and you're like, holy crap, I didn't see that one coming. And it's, you, you get these reminders of how fragile, you know, life really is and to really enjoy and embrace some of the things that we, we quite honestly just take for granted. Is there anything additional? Like obviously the, the advice that you shared that you'd give yourself, is there anything additional you'd give the audience on top of that? You know, I feel like a lot of it's been said, well, it's all been said so many times, but the the relish each moment that you have with your kids and with your your spouse, your significant other, your your friends, family. <clears throat> Cuz you really don't know when it's going to all end and and the whole not going to bed mad, not letting a a uh a fight lasts longer than it needs to. I think all, all of those things, I mean, like, <clears throat> cause my wife and I were, we were seeing a counselor, I think prior to all the, the stroke um, to try to work through some past traumas that we had done to each other. Um, and all of those things kind of seemed to be pushed aside or, or seemed so irrelevant after the stroke. Like when we went back to see the counselor again, after the stroke, it was like a whole new relationship had been formed because that the past didn't matter, that those things were things that had happened and, and yeah, they were traumatic and, and were damaging, but it was like this whole new light had been shown upon us or, or we're shown upon reality that that there was so much more to look forward to, and those small things really were of no consequence. Um, so, I don't know if I am answering your question or not, but <clears throat> um, yeah live in the moment and, and, uh, smile more, <laughs> laugh more. Yeah. Don't take life too seriously. Seriously. You'll never get out alive. Right. Yeah. It's true. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and just being such an advocate for, and such a good reminder for us to live our best life. Cause we, we need to be reminded of that. You know, one of the things that you and I talked about before I hit record today, was, you know, I told you where I wanted to really focus the show and that's, you know, living in the moment. And, and I appreciate so much you allowing us into your world of what happened to you. Cause I, cause it, it was a traumatic event. Uh, and many of us, you know, we don't, we, we don't quite get that. We don't quite grasp that. You know, I'm in my, I'm in my forties and I just had a birthday and my wife and I were talking here recently and I was like, man, I was like, these years are just flying by, you know? And she's like, yeah, I, I agree. And I was like, do you think about, do you think about the end of your life? Do you think about death ever? She's like, I actually do all the time now. Like, it's kind of like, I've never really thought more about it as I do here recently that how fragile life is and how quickly it's going. She's like, you know, it makes me really, really want to savor things and really be intentional with my time and t intentional with, you know, who I give that time to and, you know, the things that I say and the, and the actions that I take and the decisions that I make. 
And many of us, I don't think live that way. Many of us live that we sort of were like, we're kind of invincible to some degree. And we don't, we don't take advantage of that one more story at bed. You know, we don't take advantage of the extra long hug from our daughters. You know, we don't take advantage of the time with our spouses that we maybe could or should. And, you know, your story, man, is such a powerful reminder of, you know, these things can kind of come out of nowhere and they can really, they can rattle you quite a bit, right? Wake you up a little bit. And so I really appreciate you coming on and allowing us, you know, into your world and allowing us to just get somewhat of a sense of this horrible traumatic event that you went through. And I, and I also have to say that it it's, you know, it's, it's such a, your story as traumatic as it is, it's also a blessing to us because it's, and you're a blessing to others because it's a reminder of like, Hey guys, well, life, life ain't so uh, it's, it's pretty darn fragile. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it's not a steel trap. It's not, it's not anything that's, that's indestructible. It can be take, it can be taken away from us at any moment. And just to remind us to, to, to live in that. So thank you so much for sharing that, ma'am. Sure. Yeah. One thing to add that while you're thinking, or while you were talking, and I know, I think you have a hard stop here soon, but, um, was expectations. I think that would be one other thing I would say to myself, to my 35 year old self is to, to change how I think about expectations and have the expectations be more about how I live my life rather than what I expect to be happening. So I think you had one of your podcasts, you had said, instead of expecting that dinner is going to go really well tonight and my son's going to eat his food without me having to feed him, that instead change your expectation to how you're going to how I'm going to change my behavior or how my behavior is going to be the thing that's going to be different because that's what I have control over. And I don't, I can't control my son's ability to eat his peas as much as I'd like to say I could. Um, But I can change my expectation of, of how I will treat him or how I will react to his eating or not eating. And it's, it's that reaction or that expectation that, that I'm, I'm expecting a lot more of myself now. So I, expect I can, more of yourself. Yeah, I, <laughs> people. I can, people, I can definitely understand that, man. Um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of us are living way below our potential. Right. And I think a lot of it has to do with too, the, the fact that we, we think that there's always going to be um, time. Like if, if we could change one thing, I think it would be this, it would be to increase the feeling of urgency in our lives of like, don't wait. Right. Yeah. I, I, you know, you've been doing the accelerator mastermind with us for, for a bit now. And most of the guys who apply to be a part of our programs, you know, they, they move forward. And then there are some guys who don't, you know, they're like, I just want to wait for a while. And sometimes we're like, wait for what? Like, what are you waiting for? You know, that things don't, things don't get better on their own. They get better because of what you, what you do about it. And I can't even tell you, Mark, how many times we've had men apply, we've met with them and then they decide, oh, I'm just going to wait for a bit. Six months roll by, year rolls by, they come and they join and they're like, and I can't even tell you how many times I've heard I should have never waited because I missed out on six months of momentum that could have been behind me right now. I'd be in a much different place right now, a year of momentum. I'd be in a much different place right now. My marriage would be in a different place. My business would be in a different place. The relationship with my kids would be in a different place. And now I got to make up for it. So, you know, that, that lack of urgency is something that's really real and the lack of urgency to some degree, it makes total sense for us at times. I I don't know about you. And I I think you and I are cut from the same cloth. When I say this, whenever I'm presented with something of something I'm going to do, right. 
I think of it, I don't necessarily think of like, what is it going to cost me if I do this time-wise, energy-wise, resources-wise? I now think about what's the cost if I don't do this? Like that, that's, that's a real decision. I, I think a lot of people never truly get there. Yeah. You know, and if you think about everyday life, right? Like what's the cost of me not giving an extra long hug to my daughter? What's the cost of not taking a little bit extra time for one more book with my son? You know, these things that we think that there are, there's always going to be tomorrow and they're quite frankly might not be right. But, um, your story is really powerful, man. And, you know, again, thank you so much for, for sharing it with us. It's, it's, I know it's not easy to share it and I just want to honor and appreciate you for sharing it. So thank you for opening up your life to us. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, this was fun, man. Um, gentlemen, for all the show notes and like, listen, if you want to connect with us uh, or if you, even if you want to connect with Mark in any way, shape or form, we'll have uh, all his um, all his contact information in the show notes for you guys. All you have to do is head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday six three. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash Friday six three. Mark, thank you so much for coming on, man. This was really, really fantastic and such a powerful yeah. reminder and such a blessing to us. So thank you for opening up your life to us, man. Dude, thanks for all, all that you're doing for all of us. Appreciate you. Man. You are living legendary. I love it. Live legendary, man. You got to do it. You got one shot at this life, man. I think I heard that a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> be a tagline. That's right. Good tagline. All right, gentlemen, we are done for today. Like I said, head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday six, three. If you want to connect with Mark also, we'll have an application for you in there uh, for dad edge accelerator. If you're a business owner, also dad edge Alliance, if you're not. Um, and by all means, make sure you guys are joining us in October, October 20th and 21st at the dad edge summit here in St. Louis, Missouri. I'll have a link for you guys uh, to go grab tickets for that particular uh, event as well. It's going to be our fourth annual, should be our fifth, fourth annual Dad Edge Summit. It will be absolutely unforgettable. Gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care. <laughs>